Thank you very much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and such a wealth. There are at least two other sessions right now that I wish I could attend. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my work on water and why water has been such a central theme in the history of South and Southeast Asia as I've tried to think about it. But um, one of the sessions going on right now, which I'm very sorry to miss, um, includes Ranjit Hoskote. And because I can't go and hear him, I would actually like to start with a verse uh, from his recent collection, Jonah Whale, which I think is an incredibly evocative, uh, poetic, historical evocation of the power of water and the sea. And this is from the poem, As It Emptieth Itself. The river stabs the sea. Water, salt and fresh, bursts up through the splintered ribs of the scuttled boat that's trailed a wake of belly-up fish, Thalassa. The compass bird points to the coast, to a river mouth disgorging crumbled islands, to the tide wash that numbs the wounds by which conquerors named it. Trapped by the trader's sovereign eye, by the surveyors of revenue land, the purveyors of clove and camphor, the coast signals its own tongue, breaking with the horizon's grammar, a stutterance. And in those lines, I think we have such a beautiful encapsulation of both the geography and the history of water. Often, I think water seems to us only to have a geography, not a history. We take its geography for granted. And my starting point in a lot of my work as a historian has been to think about what water has meant in both natural and human history. It is so vital that it is both a material and a cultural element. It shapes the limits of what is materially possible, but also inspires very human dreams of mastery, ideas of divinity, fears and longing. My new book, Unruly Waters, looks at India's and Asia's modern history from the perspective of water. I think the vastness of water makes it difficult to write about, and particularly difficult for those of us who are not scientists who look at hydraulic systems. Very often, we have very fine studies of, of particular rivers, of particular bodies of water and what they have meant, what they have meant very profoundly to local communities, to human societies. In Unruly Waters, what I've tried to do is to somehow capture the vastness of water. And in fact, the protagonist of that book, if there is one, is the monsoon. Because the monsoon really does tie the mountains and the coasts, the rivers and the oceans together. But the monsoon has also been at the center of so much of India's cultural history, going back to the epics. The monsoon is at the very heart of Indian agriculture, of the economy, and it provides a way to think about that intersection of water, society, economy, and power. So the monsoon is one sort of protagonist in this book, but so too are meteorologists, engineers, farmers, all of those who have tried to understand, even master water. And if there's one message, of course, that comes through from that history, it is that every attempt to master water is illusory, provides and generates unintended consequences. Another theme that runs through the book is the way that water both connects and divides Asia across borders. We very often tend to focus on one or the other of those things. We think of the great rivers that pay very little attention to national borders, or we think of water as a form of national territory to be defended. In all of the talk of water wars, in the idea that water itself will generate conflict in the coming years, 
I tried to think about both of those things in interconnection. The way that water creates imaginative connections, physical interdependencies, but also, yes, it generates conflict. I'd like to begin by just reading a little bit from the first chapter of, of Unruly Waters, which sets out this perspective on water and history. The struggle for water in modern history is a global story. We can tell a version of it set in the Western United States, or in Germany, or in the Soviet Union, which was an Asian as well as a European power. But nowhere has the search for water shaped or sustained as much human life as in India and China. Their demographic weight is not a fact of nature. It is an outcome of history, a history in which the control of water was pivotal. Today, that control is more rigorous than ever, thanks to intensive hydraulic engineering. But the foundations of that control are fragile. Nowhere is the multiplier effect of any destabilization in the material conditions of life greater than it is in Asia. And this too demands a historical explanation. As rains grow erratic and storm surges more intense, as rivers change course and wells dry up, the hard-won gains of half a century are vulnerable to reversal. The force of planetary warming combines with the material legacy of earlier quests to control water. Warming seas meet coastal zones that sag under the weight of growing cities, many of them founded as colonial ports in the 18th and 19th centuries. River deltas are sinking, starved of sediment by large dams upstream that were built in the 1950s and 60s. We live with the unintended consequences of earlier generations' dreams and fears of water. And for me, that is what the history of water means. When I was recently telling somebody about my work, a scientist, he said, well, does the monsoon need a history? Surely it just, it is. It has a natural history, perhaps. But what is the connection with cultural, social, economic, environmental history? I think those connections are profound. And one of the things that I would like to suggest, and which I think Unruly Waters tries to present, is the idea that what is unique about the last 30 or 40 years is really that the natural and the human histories of the monsoon have collided. That is to say, we've come to the point where human activities, very often unintended, have begun to reshape the monsoon itself. And as a historian, I think that is a profound shift in perspective compared with what I am used to thinking and dealing with. Water played an essential role in the political history of empires in modern Asia, and India is no exception to this. The geography of empire in India was sculpted by wind and water. Until the 19th century, the India that Europeans knew, the India they were interested in, was the India that was wet. They sailed to India's coasts, swept there by the direction of the monsoon winds. In the 18th century, they moved upriver into the Ganga Valley, heartland of successive Indian empires. But the British faced the same hydraulic dilemmas of every South Asian empire before them. The sea routes between India and the world were governed by the reversal of the winds. Communication between the coasts and the interior was slow. India's mighty rivers could be traveled up only at certain times of the year. Roads were poor. The East India Company's revenues were tied to the cycle of planting and harvesting. Only gradually did the company incorporate arid zones into its domain. Over the next half century, British engineers and administrators and investors sought to master nature as a step towards connecting India's interior more closely to its coastal ports and from there to the rest of the world. The quest to understand, maybe to master water in India, fused the efforts of adventurers and engineers, mariners and scientists, 
They were driven by curiosity, by necessity. Some sought profit and renown. Others followed their private enthusiasms. Not all of them served the colonial state. Their work would not have been possible without the ingenuity of Indian assistants, observers, draftsmen, recorders, porters, soldiers, whose achievements have been effaced for the most part from the historical record. Women were scarce in the scientific world, but the few who were involved made contributions of lasting significance. The science of water in 19th century India traced the descent of the rivers, the tracks of the storms, and the path of the rains. Each of these crossed the borders of British India. Knowledge of each brought awareness of interdependencies and inequalities on a regional scale. Each provoked new kinds of political intervention. In all of the work that I've done over the last 10 years or so, I've been interested in two different dimensions of water, the lateral and then more recently the vertical dimensions of water. What do I mean by that? The lateral dimensions of water we might think of in terms of how the rivers have connected India within and how the Indian Ocean has linked India to a much wider world. And in the previous book I wrote called Crossing the Bay of Bengal, I wrote about the Indian Ocean as really a highway connecting India and Southeast Asia. It was a story of how ancient connections between traders, pilgrims, even the Chola Empire, became something fundamentally different in the 19th century. It gave way to one of the largest movements of people in global history. Something like 29 or 30 million people traveled back and forth between India and just three destinations in Southeast Asia, Burma, above all, Malaya, and Sri Lanka in that late 19th and early 20th century moment. And this reshaped both India and Southeast Asia. So my interest in water began by thinking about how water connects, how parts of coastal South India were more densely connected to Southeast Asia in the 19th and early 20th centuries than they were to what we now think of as the Indian nation state. To give you just one example of that, there were more people of South Indian origin in Colombo, in Rangoon, in Penang, in Singapore, than any Indian city outside Madras presidency in the early 20th century. That world that linked Southeast Asia, South India to Southeast Asia is one that we lost sight of, I think, in the 20th century with the coming of national histories and national borders. And one of my big questions was really, where do the traces of that connection live? The answer is that they live everywhere. You only need to start walking through any of the port cities of Southeast Asia, Singapore, Penang, and even the names of the streets, Chetty Street, Chulia Street, testify to that long history. It's a history that has very little place in textbooks. It's a history that children in both Indian and Malaysian or Singaporean schools are taught very little about. But it's a history that was made possible by the fact that the water, the Bay of Bengal, connected as much as it divided people, at least until the middle of the 20th century. I'd like to just read a little bit from the opening section of Crossing the Bay of Bengal to give a sense of what the Bay of Bengal came to mean in my imagination as a historian. Picture the Bay of Bengal as an expanse of tropical water still in blue in the calm of January winter, or raging and turbid with silt at the peak of summer rains. Picture it in two dimensions on a map, overlaid with a web of shipping channels and telegraph cables, inscribed with lines marking distance. Now imagine the sea as a mental map, as a family tree of cousins, uncles, sisters, sons, connected by letters and journeys and stories. Think of it as a sea of debt, bound by advances and loans and obligations. Picture the Bay of Bengal even where it is absent, deep in the Malaysian forest, where Hindu shrines sprout from the landscape as if washed by the sea, left behind. There are many ways of envisaging the Bay of Bengal as a place with a history, as one as rich 
and complex as the history of any national territory. And yet there is no museum to the history of the Bay of Bengal. It is a history that has very largely become invisible. And so one of my quests as a historian was to try to find the traces that that history left behind. But at the same time that the sea became an expansive sort of connection between India and Southeast Asia, between India and West Asia, between India and Eastern Africa, a connection that was channeled above all by the movement of labor, by the movement of labor in conditions of unfreedom and very often conditions of great brutality. There was another sort of geography of water that started to take hold. Might even think of it as another dimension in the geography of water. And that is its vertical expanse. I'm going to read a little bit from Unruly Waters about the moment in the late 19th century when groundwater came to be central to how people imagined India's future, and indeed how they imagined India's geography of water. Among the resources that the Indian Irrigation Commission looked to was India's ocean of water under the ground. By the late 19th century, the quest for subterranean water had attained new fervor. A breakthrough in technology brought with it a sense of untapped possibility. Engine-driven pumps promised to reach much deeper underground than the manual ways that had changed little since Emperor Babur's time. After the famine of the 1870s, agricultural officials in the most arid districts encouraged the construction of wells by landowners. The main difficulty in the construction is not the discovery of water, wrote a director of agriculture in the northwestern provinces. The water level is known locally all over. The problem was to determine where the soil could support deep wells. By the early 20th century, Madras was at the forefront of a water mining boom. A keen observer of this economic revolution was a character named Alfred Chatterton, a British engineer who'd made his career in the Madras government. He was superintendent of industrial education. He was actually sympathetic to Swadeshi initiatives to support local manufacturing. But irrigation became his obsession. He wrote a book on histories of lift irrigation, that is well irrigation, and the possibilities he saw before him were endless. I am sanguine enough to think, he wrote, just around the turn of the 20th century, that this is merely the beginning of things, that in the next year or two, the use of oil engines will increase very rapidly for irrigation work. Most of the engines ran on liquid fuel, that is to say petroleum, which was half or even a quarter the price of kerosene oil. The main source of supply was from the Borneo oil fields imported by Best and Company, held in 4,000 ton storage tanks in Madras. India tumbled into the embrace of fossil fuels. And very early in the 20th century, it was oil that unleashed a vision of plenitude based on the extraction of water. A vision that continues to shape contemporary India. The oil engine and pump do work, Chatterton observed, utilizing to an extent absolutely unknown previously the quantity of water available for irrigation. The abundance of water beneath the soil lay in a succession of channels, one below the other. Their exploitation had once relied on a vast core of labor, but now the pumps unleashed a new vision. The potential for further development seemed vast. Water engineers imagined a whole country underground, a network of vanished rivers still running with water, waiting to be forced to the surface by pumps. On this view, the problem of subterranean water was really a problem of energy. This is the same moment that, as Amitav Ghosh writes so powerfully in the history chapter of the Great Derangement, 
the discovery of oil reserves in Burma and elsewhere start to unleash new imaginations of future possibilities. And one of the things that really strikes me is that the geography of water in India is actually transformed by oil. From this came exactly that, a project to map India in new ways, to map the water underground, to draw meteorological maps of rainfall regions, to start to think of how the geography of water shaped India's economy and shaped India's future. There's a beautiful passage um, from Michael Ondaatje's novel, Anil's Ghost, which I think really captures, though he's writing about Sri Lanka, about Ceylon, the kinds of maps and materials that from the 1870s and 1880s began to inscribe this new sense of the geography of water. The National Atlas of Sri Lanka, Ondaatje writes, has 73 versions of the island, each template revealing only one aspect, one obsession, rainfall, winds, surface waters of lakes, rarer bodies of water locked deep within the earth. And one of my obsessions as a historian has come to be to find the archives of water. Because to find the archives of water, we need to go beyond what we as historians are trained primarily to look at. And it remains the case that historians are trained, as I was, first and foremost to go to government archives. And government archives are a wonderful source for the history of water. You look at the records of the sanitation department and you find the most minute details of pipelines and water supply and rainfall. I found myself in the library of the meteorological department in Pune in a beautiful library where behind glass-fronted cases was a whole archive of India's rainfall, which was produced in handwritten logs starting in the 1870s of rainfall at every station, hundreds of stations around the country. These are archives that climate scientists today still use, still find essential to construct their models of how the monsoon is changing. But the archives of water are much vaster than that. They lie in physical evidence that scientists are starting to find on the ocean floor. They lie in tree ring data that historical climatologists are starting to work with. They lie in air pollution data because we increasingly are coming to see the relationship between air pollution and rainfall in South Asia over the last 30 years. So I had to learn a lot about other fields in thinking about where this history of water lies. It lies in the textual record, it lies in poetry, it lies in fiction, and it lies in a new sort of collaboration that I think we need between historians and novelists and poets and climate scientists. We're used to thinking about how geography shapes history there's a recent book that I think just encapsulates that way of thinking called Prisoners of Geography. It's a book that really tries to explain many of the fault lines in global politics, primarily in terms of geography. I'm more interested in the opposite relationship, which is how history shapes geography. And what do I mean by that? And the quest to reshape geography is an ancient quest. Agriculture itself, the origins of agriculture, marked a profound transformation in human relationship to nature. The quest to bring water to the desert, as Dr. Rajendra Singh very movingly described earlier today, is an age-old quest. But there's no doubt that something fundamental has changed in our power to reshape geography. Go back to the passage I just read about the earliest experiments in using motored pumps to extract groundwater from India. That process by the late 20th century had completely transformed India's geography of water. Until the 19th century, it was just an article of faith that the productive parts of India, India's rice bowls and bread baskets, were the monsoon-fed lands primarily Bengal and parts of the southeast. 
over the course of the 20th century, India's geography of water has been inverted. That is to say, the regions of agricultural growth have been the arid regions, Punjab, parts of the southeast. In an agricultural revolution, that's almost entirely powered by groundwater. And so that technology, in a sense, really does reshape India's hydraulic geography. But with that has come a whole raft of unintended consequences. In the late 19th and early 20th century, a lot of colonial geographers, especially French colonial geographers, wrote of what they called monsoon Asia. They had this conception that the monsoon had created similar rhythms of agriculture and therefore of culture across a whole band of Asia, stretching from India in the west to China in the east through many parts of Southeast Asia. What's striking about this idea of monsoon Asia is for them, the monsoon was sovereign. It was the monsoon that shaped culture. It was the monsoon that shaped economic possibilities. It was the monsoon that shaped political possibilities. The history of the last 40 or 50 years has seen a reversal of that equation. We, however you define that we, and I think we can have a debate about that, we have reshaped the monsoon, even as the monsoon continues to play a fundamental role in Indian economy and in Indian society. And one of the forgotten episodes in that is one that I spend a little bit of time excavating in unruly waters. And that is we've forgotten that some of the earliest evidence of climate change actually came from scientific research on the Indian Ocean. And that is part of the story of climate science in the late 20th century that I think hasn't quite been told. In the early 1960s, there was an international scientific project called the Indian Ocean Expedition, which sought to explore the Indian Ocean for the first time. Oceanographers were involved, meteorologists were involved, and what they found was in many ways shocking. What they found took a long time, maybe up to two decades, to really find wider public discussion and wider acceptance. Just going to read a little bit from my account of the Indian Ocean expedition in Unruly Waters. In the end, the Indian Ocean expedition involved 40 ships from 13 countries. The list of countries involved does not map easily onto the geography of the Cold War. Many large states bordering the Indian Ocean were enthusiastic participants, including hostile neighbors, India and Pakistan, as well as Australia and Indonesia. The United States played a, a leading role, but the largest ship in the expedition was contributed by the Soviet Union. The Indian Ocean expedition marked the rebirth of German oceanography after the war and showed the resurgent scientific and technical prowess of Japan. The Indian ships on the expedition reflected in their origins, in their shape, in their materials, different epochs of seafaring history. The Kistna, its sleek lines betraying naval origins, as one observer puts it, was built as a naval frigate in 1943 a product of the Second World War's boost to Indian industry, which my friend Srinath Raghavan has described so beautifully in his recent book. Now armed with an Edo echo sounder with a range of 6,000 fathoms, the ship was fitted for oceanographic research, but it came with a warning, austere living conditions, not fit for women scientists, no salt water bath fitted. The smallest vessel in the expedition was the RV Conch, which belonged to the University of Kerala. It represented a much older tradition of shipbuilding. It was a small ship built of hardwood in the long tradition of coastal craft that had threaded together India's western coast for centuries. By contrast, the trawler RV Varuna was brand new, purpose built in Norway in 1961. Despite its novelty, it came with the same men-only warning as the naval frigate. Women scientists cannot be housed. From the earliest days of the spice traders, the Indian Ocean was very often crossed predominantly by men. Some things were very slow to change, 
and the loss to Indian Ocean science has been considerable. The expedition's research aims encompass the study of ocean currents and littoral drifts, an investigation of ocean chemistry, salinity, and temperature. Much of the excitement came from the new technologies that allowed scientists to see the sea anew. Sonar technology allowed them to hear enough to map the Indian Ocean's sea floor by sound with heightened accuracy. And their images evoked an underwater continent as varied as the topography of the land above. Advances in satellite technology provided synoptic pictures of cloud cover and precipitation. Computers allowed scientists to process quantities of data beyond all precedent. Among all of the Indian Ocean Expedition's endeavors, one observer wrote, none shows more contrast between past and present than meteorology. Because a crucial component of the Indian Ocean Expedition was the International Meteorological Center that was set up here in Bombay in 1963 at the Kolaba Observatory, which was first built as an astronomical observatory by the East India Company in 1826. Already during the UN's International Geophysical Year of 1957-58, Indian meteorologists had made a signal contribution. And now they were at the forefront of trying to understand the relationship between the ocean, the climate, and India's future. In a pamphlet published from the Kolaba Center, its director, a climate scientist called Colin Ramage, described the center at work. And it's an evocative picture. Throughout the night, staff in the small air-conditioned communications room have been receiving broadcast coded weather reports from the Indian Ocean region in Morse code and on teleprinters. Pictures of charts analyzed a few minutes before in Nairobi, Moscow, and Canberra unroll from the facsimile printers. Officers disgorge figure-crammed sheets of paper containing detailed information on Indian weather and on weather over the whole eastern hemisphere north of the equator. In this scene, the Indian Ocean comes alive, where as a zone of trade by the 1960s, it was largely dead. The sea was connected in a new way by weather maps and the flow of data through facsimile printers. In the late 19th century, the expanded collection of data transmitted through the telegraph allowed the first synoptic weather maps to be drawn. Now there were new knowledges overlaid on old British imperial networks of weather reporting when new centers, including Moscow, Vladivostok. This nocturnal hive of activity in a small corner of South Bombay gave substance to the Indian Ocean as a vast weather system stretching beyond national boundaries. Ominous signs emerged from the Indian Ocean expedition. Just two years before the expedition began, Roger Revelle, who was one of its architects, had written with his colleague, the geochemist Hans Seuss, that human beings were conducting unwittingly a large-scale geophysical experiment with the world's climate. Within a few centuries, they wrote, we are returning to the atmosphere and oceans the concentrated organic carbon stored in sedimentary rocks over hundreds of millions of years. And one of their long-range goals for the Indian Ocean Expedition was to study how the Indian Ocean had become what they called a dump for the waste products of industrial civilization. They sought to determine in particular the role of the ocean in climate change. We have forgotten how important the Indian Ocean was to documenting anthropogenic climate change and prompting early stirrings of alarm. So with the power to control water have come new uncertainties and new unpredictability. And one of the most interesting things from a historical perspective is the advances in the recent study of the South Asian monsoon, a tradition that goes back to the 19th century. And what has been clear is that the monsoon has become more erratic, more unpredictable over the last two decades, something that is known intimately 
to fishing communities and farmers across India. Something that has been very much in the news recently with the farmers' march to Delhi. Something where common perceptions and meteorological research are really starting to map onto one another. And what is most terrifying about the changes in the monsoon is really how planetary warming and regional drivers of climate change intersect to create a dangerous new cocktail. The meteorologist Deepthi Singh, for example, has written very interestingly about how aerosols and land use change are interfering with monsoon circulation at the same time as global warming is interfering with it on a much larger scale. So one of my big dilemmas as a historian is how to think of the history of water when, in many ways, that history, it seems to me now, is at a moment of profound rupture in terms of the order of causation. Does geography, does water shape us? Do we shape water? To conclude, I'd just like to read one final section from the book. And then I think we might have time for a few, a few questions and, and discussion, comments. So this is from the conclusion. Throughout history, water has both connected and divided Asia. The rivers and oceans have been thoroughfares of trade as well as zones of imperial domination. In the 19th century, when European empires dominated the world, Asia's hydrology fueled global industrial capitalism. The storms that have always menaced coastal regions crossed frontiers, but states have responded to them in different ways. As connections across Asia frayed in the mid-20th century decades of war and nationalism, water too came under ever tighter territorial control. One reason why almost all of Asia's new nation states tried so boldly to harness water was to gain self-sufficiency in a post-colonial era in which their autonomy was repeatedly called into question by the machinations of the superpowers in the Cold War. They were spurred to do so by memories of water's lack, bitter memories of famine and suffering within living memory. They were spurred, especially in India, by a fear of the monsoon climate and the power it had over human life. For us in India, scarcity is only a missed monsoon away, Indira Gandhi said, as late as the late 1960s. And in this sense of a battle against enormous natural forces, that inspired in her and in so many others a tug between despair and optimism that science and technology held the key to liberation. Over time, that insistence on self-sufficiency, combined with a sense of perpetual crisis, led to a narrowing of vision and a willful blindness to the consequences of repeated attempts to conquer nature. Today, the inability of states to think beyond their borders imperils lives and denudes the political imagination. If there is one consistent lesson, it is that water management never has been and never can be a purely technical question. Neither can it be addressed on a purely national scale. Ideas about the distribution and management of water are deeply inflected with cultural values, with notions of justice, with ideas and fears about nature and climate including very old fears about the monsoon, which grows more capricious. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes. If there are any comments or questions, I'd love to, I'd love to talk. Good afternoon. I just had a question on whether civilizations which grow out of inland waterways and the sea are they essentially different and what is the geography and history of these uh, two comparatives? That's a wonderful question. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we're coming to realize is how closely connected riverine civilizations have been to oceanic ones for a long time. But I think you do also see moments of transition and transfer. Um, one of the things that's very striking in, in Southeast Asia, for example, is that migration in the 14th or 15th century away from the old inland capitals, places like Bagan and Angkor towards the coastal port cities. And I think you do see a similar 
ebb and flow on the Ganga, for example, times when coastal ports are more prominent in the development of, of material culture and the development and the exercise of political power, and, and times when, as was true with the European domination in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, maritime power seems sort of direct and dominate the capacities of particular powers to exercise power over large regions. But I think I'm always very interested in the connections between the Riverine and the Oceanic. And one of the things that I was left with when I finished writing my history of the Bay of Bengal was a sense that, in fact, we need to integrate that story much more upriver with the way in which the, you know, a, a friend of mine, Iftigar Iqbal, who's a wonderful environmental historian, has described the Brahmaputra as an arm of the Bay of Bengal. And I think there are ways in which one can think about oceanic and riverine societies in their very close interconnections with one another. Thank you, Sunil, for that really superb talk. <clears throat> I just wondered if you might have something to say about the looming exhaustion of the Upper Ganga Aquifer and the aquifers in um, the south. Thank you so much, um, Tavin. It's, it's, it's lovely to, to see you here, having learned so much from the, I suppose, multiple appearances of water in your work, both fictional and, and non-fiction. Um, I think the depletion of the aquifers is, is a profound crisis. I mean, you, one look at the image that was produced by the GRACE satellite, which measures the depth of the water table, it's hor horrific, and especially in northwestern India, but also in parts of the southeast, one sees that the very core on which India's food security, the Green Revolution, everything that's happened since the late 1960s has been based might be finite, might be unsustainable in the most literal way. And I think one of the things that has been largely absent from water policy is a focus on replenishing the aquifers. I mean, rather than, you know, in a sense, what one is still fixed on large dams um, as one sees in, in the quest to build more and more of them in the Himalayas uh, at, at great risk and at great cost. But, you know, there's very interesting work by the water policy specialist Tushar Shah, who said, well, why don't we use some of these existing structures to think more about the replenishment of, of groundwater? And I think that's something of a priority, yet something that isn't talked about enough. Thank you once again for a great talk. Uh, I have a question about Bangalore. It's one of the largest cities in India now, and it is one of the largest cities in the world, which is far away from a river. So, and we constantly read things in the press about how the, you know, Bangalore is going to be a dead city in five years or 10 years or whatever it is, largely because the whole uh, old system of carries or those lakes have been dammed and, you know, building development has taken place. So, do you have any thoughts on Bangalore? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think one way, it might be helpful to think about it is to think about Bangalore alongside so many other cities in the world that have developed in some sense where, where there is no water or where there is not enough water. I mean, one thinks of the American West, for example, and there are similar stories. I and mean, Mike Davis wrote so wonderfully, I think, about you know, the, the engineering and the creation of the American West really only by bringing water to where you know, ecology does not necessarily support that scale um, of development. And I mean, I think one of the most alarming things in Bangalore is that in fact, it had developed with a very sophisticated local system of water management. If one thinks of all the tanks and the reservoirs and the lakes, you know, the very idea that it was called the city of lakes, which is something that is almost unimaginable in Bangalore now, and yet, which is only in the recent past. Um, I think you know, there are lots of things that are happening on a local level in Bangalore to try to do something to, to restore those older water bodies, to spread awareness of them and the idea that they may be a, a lifeline to the city in a way that's been forgotten. I mean, I think one could think even of coastal cities that way in terms of how a lot of the water that they may have is not usable. I mean, that whole history of water shortages in Chennai is, I think, a very similar thing. And I think what one sees there, what one sees here, is, of course, the large cities are drawing deeper and deeper inland for their water supplies at, at a cost to local people and at the cost of conflict.